Hi, my name is Sari Kraft, and I practice primary care sport and exercise medicine in Toronto. In this talk, I'll be covering some common conditions that you'll see in a sport medicine practice, and a few less common but more serious injuries that you don't want to miss. Like all the other review lectures, this is a really big topic, and this won't be a comprehensive list. You'll find that reviewing the anatomy and surface anatomy of the wrist before we go over these conditions will help with understanding each of them and with your physical exam and differential diagnosis. I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. This is a list of the conditions that we'll be going over. I've divided them by type of tissue affected. We'll start with bone injuries and cover distal radius fractures, scaphoid fractures, hook of hamate fracture, Kinebox disease, distal radial physial stress injury, and impingement syndromes. Then we'll move on to ligaments and cartilage and cover scapholunate injuries, lunotriquetral injuries, lunate and perilunate dislocation, distal radial ulnar joint instability, and triangular fibrocartilaginous complex injury. Then we'll talk about tendon conditions, including de Quervain's tenosynovitis, intersection syndrome, extensor carpi ulnaris tendinopathy, and flexor carpi ulnaris and flexor carpi radialis tendinopathy. We'll cover nerve issues, including carpal tunnel syndrome and ulnar nerve compression, and then talk about ganglion cysts. Let's get started with bone injuries. Distal radius fractures are common in athletes and in the general population, most commonly from falling on an outstretched hand, or fouche for short, with an extended wrist. In kids, these fractures can involve the growth plates as well. With that mechanism, you'd also want to rule out a scaphoid fracture, distal radial ulnar joint injury, and scapholunate injury. Sometimes these can also occur concurrently. Usually athletes will have focal bruising, swelling, and tenderness at the distal radius. There may be an obvious deformity, but the wrist may look normal, especially if there's no displacement and early on before there's any swelling. The diagnosis is made on x-ray, but CT might be needed to further evaluate if surgery is necessary or for surgical planning. In the x-ray here, you can see an intraarticular comminuted fracture. Non-displaced extraarticular fractures can be treated with reduction and immobilization in a short arm cast. Displaced, comminuted, angulated, or shortened fractures should be referred to orthopedics. And just like with any fracture, you should always do a neurovascular exam, and if there's any neurovascular compromise, then they need urgent reduction and orthopedic assessment. Scaphoid fractures are also common in athletes and occur with the same mechanism as distal radius fractures. It's the most commonly fractured carpal bone, and because of its distal to proximal blood supply, scaphoid fractures have a high risk of non-union and avascular necrosis, so it's important to catch them early so that they can be properly treated. The highest prevalence is in the 15 to 30 year old population, which overlaps with a lot of the sport medicine population. Any athlete with the right mechanism and radial wrist pain and tenderness in the right area should be considered to have a scaphoid fracture until proven otherwise. The main finding to watch for is tenderness in the anatomic snuff box, proximal to the base of the thumb, between the extensor pollicis longus and brevis tendons. You can see that in this picture. Other findings like swelling, decreased range of motion, and pain with wrist extension are common but less specific. X-ray is the initial investigation, and it should include scaphoid views, but it can still miss a fracture. If there's tenderness in the anatomic snuff box, but initial x-rays are negative, you can immobilize the thumb in a, in a thumb spica cast and repeat the x-rays in two weeks, or you can get advanced imaging like CT or MRI, or you can get a bone scan to rule out a fracture. If there's any displacement or non-union after immobilization, then they, they should see a surgeon for surgical fixation. Fractures of the hook of the hamate can also occur in sports, especially those involving rackets, bats, or sticks like golf or lacrosse. It can be a stress fracture from repeat impact. In the picture here, you can see that the bottom of the bat impacts just over the hook of the hamate in the non-dominant hand, which is marked with an arrow. Acute fractures can also occur with a sudden increased force, like when a golfer hits the ground with a club, or sometimes from a fall on the outstretched hand. In this case, the pain and tenderness would be at the ulnar palmar aspect of the wrist. If you place the IP joint of your thumb over the pisiform, the tip of your thumb will be over the prominence of the hook of the hamate. 
resisted flexion of the fourth and fifth MCPs might be painful since the tendons are just radial to the hook of the hamate and contracting them will push against it. Start with an x-ray of this area, including a carpal tunnel view. If the x-rays are negative, a CT, MRI, or bone scan is more sensitive. Non-displaced fractures can be immobilized, but if there's any displacement or non-union, then they should be referred to a surgeon for either open reduction internal fixation or excision. Kindbox disease, or avascular necrosis of the lunate, can happen with repetitive trauma. There's usually an insidious onset of generalized dorsal pain, stiffness, or weakness. Physical exam findings aren't very specific, and it can include tenderness of the lunate, decreased range of motion, and decreased grip strength. Early x-rays may be negative, but in later stages you'll see sclerosis and flattening of the lunate, like in this picture. MRI will show changes earlier on. If the x-rays are normal, then immobilization may be effective. But if there are radiographic changes, or if there's progressive pain, then they should be referred to a surgeon. The gymnast wrist is a whole topic unto itself, and we could do a whole talk just on that. But there are a few things that you might see in this population. Young gymnasts, generally between the ages of 10 and 14, who do a high volume of training, often over 35 hours a week, can get osteolysis of the distal radial growth plate from repetitive loading and weight bearing on the upper extremity. You may also see this in climbers and weightlifters since they have a similar mechanism of loading the wrist. They'll complain of pain at the dorsal radial wrist when weight bearing on the hands. In gymnastics, this will affect handstands, tumbling, which is when they flip onto their hands and then back onto their feet, and vault when there's a high load on the wrist as they hit the apparatus. They'll be tender over the distal radius, might have swelling, and they might have decreased extension range of motion. Sometimes the exam is totally normal, and the pain is only reproduced with weight bearing on the hands or doing the aggravating activity. In early stages, x-rays can be normal, in which case an MRI would show some edema around the, around the growth plate. As the condition progresses, x-rays like the one pictured will show widening and irregularity of the growth plate and eventually the growth plate might fuse. If the distal radius growth plate fuses, but the ulna continues to grow, then they'll end up with a longer ulna or positive ulnar variance. And that can cause other injuries like triangular fibrocartilaginous complex or TFCC tears, which we'll talk about later. The main treatment is avoiding the activity that caused the injury in the first place, which is weight bearing on the hands. A splint or cast can help to expedite pain relief especially if there are already changes on the x-ray. And it can also stop a young gymnast who's eager to be upside down again from getting back to tumbling too soon. Once the pain's gone, then they can gradually resume activity. If there is ongoing pain, or if there's positive ulnar variance, then surgery might be indicated. Another common problem, or actually group of problems in gymnasts, is dorsal impingement or impaction. It's also common in football offensive linemen and in weightlifters since they have repetitive wrist impact. The picture here at the bottom shows the mechanism for scaphoid impingement when the dorsal scaphoid impacts the radius with repeated axial loading in extension. Ulnar impingement is also a possibility when the dorsal ulna impacts the TFCC, lunate, or triquetrum. X-rays are often normal, but in ulnar impaction syndrome, you might see positive ulnar variants. Over time, athletes might develop a dorsal ossicle at the site of impingement. The mainstay of treatment in this case is again, avoiding the aggravating activity and splinting for comfort and to avoid extension. Anti-inflammatories and cortisone injections can help with pain. For ongoing symptoms, surgery might be indicated to debride osteophytes or synovitis or for ulnar shortening in the case of positive ulnar variants.